Welcome to NAS Radio. I'm Olivier Dumas. World War II was one of the most costly world conflicts in the 20th century, and of the many battles, losses, and victories, the soldiers, airmen, and sailors who were captured and sent off to wait out the war in holding camps across Eastern and Western Europe have many stories to tell. These are just some of the POWs who are willing to share their stories with the nation and with the world. Leaving on his sixth flight, with the next bombing target being Nuremberg, Ken Imperius, rear gunner on a new Lancaster unit flying with the 12th Squadron of the RAF, took off from Wickenby. Having their target predetermined, they were to, as with most bombing missions, to destroy the target and return over the German border into neutral territory. Unbeknownst to most of the crew, however, the unit had a crippling technical malfunction. The gas line on the bomber was leaking. Ken recounts the events that took place after they had left the airfield. So I'll just take you through... First of all, what aircraft did you fly in? The Lancaster. In your position? I was a rear gunner. You joined the club? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You were flying out of where? We were flying out of Wickenby. Wickenby? In England. Yeah. Which county is that? At number 12 squadron. It's an English RAF squadron. So what was your target on the night that Uh, you were shot down? Nuremberg. Nuremberg? trip number six. Did you get there? We got there. We... uh, Actually, we had a brand new aircraft when we left England, yeah. and it developed a gas leak. And uh, some one of the crew members discovered it uh, as we were crossing the channel. The engineer went back to check on and see what he could do, and he tried and tried, and uh, he came back and reported to the pilot that he couldn't stop it. And the pilot said, well, we just crossed into Germany, and uh, we might as well carry on to the target, which we did. We bombed it. And we were into, into our turning point just uh, outside of Ottensu when we were hit by a Junkers 88. And uh, I imagine there'd be a fair amount of gasoline on the floor of the aircraft and it, a bit of an explosion and uh, a ball of fire was coming towards the rear turret and then all of a sudden there was nothing. And it seemed to be flying along okay, and I thought everything was okay, but there was no communication with the rest of the crew. And then I looked again, and I suddenly realized there was no aircraft there. I was, the whole tail end had been blown off. Oh, oh. So <laughs> <laughs> I figured there was time to, <laughs> to leave. <laughs> so I tried and uh, to bail out. I couldn't get out. I tried and tried and tried, and it seemed like for hours I was trying. And I figured, well, my God, this, uh, I've got to be hitting the ground any second now. And I, I just gave up. And then uh, I heard my mother, mother's voice. And she said, Ken, you're not trying hard enough. And that's all I needed yeah. to realize that it was uh, my seat pack that was jammed up against the, the escape door. And oh, uh, yeah. so I just stood up a little, pulled back the escape door and went out backwards and I was okay. <laughs> Uh, How many of your crew survived? Uh, just the two of us. The, the bomb aimer had put on his parachute, had opened the front escape hatch, and I actually heard him say, Skipper, are you all right? And I, he was on his way to help the skipper because he had some flying experience. And he said the next thing he knew, he was, his parachute was open. He was blown right out. So it was just the two of us. Was either of you injured? No. Not a scratch. So where did you land? We landed in a field uh, near a railway track, or in a ditch. And uh, of course, I got out my little compass and uh, going to head south, Mm -hmm. which meant I had to cross the (laughs) the ditch, (laughs) up an incline over a railroad and into the bush. And uh, I figured, well, I can't go any further because it was just dense bush. And... uh, so I thought, well, I'll just have to stay here till morning and find out where I am. And uh, there was a bird above me that kept saying, cuckoo, cuckoo. <laughs> <laughs> I looked up and I said, you're damn right, I, I'm cuckoo for being here. <laughs> so in the morning, uh, I was up on top of a bit of a hill, and I could see the farmers down below with their shotguns looking for me. So I sort of hid back into, in the edge of the, the bush. And uh, while I was watching down below, a farmer with a team of horses came right by me within 10 feet that didn't see me. 
And so I hid out uh, for most of the day there. And uh, I figured, well, I'll take a look at this railway, railroad and see what's happening down below. And uh, there was a, a fellow in uniform walking by. I thought, well, if I'm going to surrender, surrender to anybody, he would be the person to, to surrender to. So <laughs> he didn't want to have anything to do with me at first. But, <laughs> but he finally took me into a little town jail and uh, I was picked up. The Lancaster Ken was in was shot down on St. Patrick's Day 1945. After subsequently bailing out and having been captured by German forces, he spent six weeks inside the Mossberg prison camp before being liberated by American forces led by General Patton. Air Force. So what, uh, what stalag did you finish up in? 7A was outside of Mossberg. Mossberg, yes. yes. What was life in, in the prison uh, with the, you know... Well, I was shot down St. Patrick's Day uh, 45, so it was just about the end of the war, and uh, they were bringing in prisoners from all over, and there was just, uh, I think they had more prisoners outside of the camp than inside. It was just mass confusion, and uh, I nobody it, bothered us. At that really. part of the war, the food was a bit tight, wasn't it? Yeah, Patton, uh, in that area. Yeah. Because uh, the one night we heard the, the shells going over the, the camp and the next morning the tanks rolled up to the, to the barbed wires and locked the gates. Yeah. And we saw General Patton drive by in his jeep with his two ivory-handled pistols. <laughs> so, How long were you incarcerated, Inby? Well, just six weeks. Six yeah. weeks. Yeah. But it was still a lifetime, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah. After reading some of the stories, uh, some of the story books, uh, I, I felt it was very fortunate because yeah. Yeah. I missed all, all the bad things that happened, you know, like the marches and that. Was it the Americans who liberated you? The Americans, then? yes. Yeah. So you got some good food out of those, did you? Yes, we did. Uh, they uh, opened up the Red Cross storage bins mm. that they had there. Yeah. and. Uh, we were all given a couple of boxes of mm. Red Cross parcels, and so we were all right. And then we were taken to an American camp in uh, France, fed the regular American meal there, which was <laughs> like <laughs> heaven to us, and then flown back to England on a Lancaster. You had a, a wait there before you came back here? Yeah, not too long. Uh, we, were, we went on leave, and as uh, soon as we... I think about the second day that we received a call to report back immediately to uh, Bournemouth and uh, we were on our way back home. So it was a very short stay in England. For more information about NAS Radio and the Nanton Aviation Station, contact 613-552-5000. This has been an NAS Radio production. I'm Olivier Dumas. Tune in next time for another exciting interview featuring Canadian and Allied war veterans.